Welcome back to the morning show here on Arise News. I'm Biola Alabi. And I'm OG Akti. I'm Rana Kaljeka. In a matter of just a few weeks, the eventful presidency of Dr. Abubakar Bukola Saraki will be brought to a close when the Ninth National Assembly is inaugurated. In the last four years, the outgoing Senate president has had a hard time keeping his exalted position, including extended periods in the docket facing charges of improper declaration of assets at the Code of Conduct Tribunal. But the good news for his political opponents is that he won't be returning to the Senate in the up incoming disposition, having been swept away by the now famous O Together movement in his native Kwara states in north central Nigeria. Dr. Saraki's continuing story signposts the gathering storm ahead of the inauguration of the Ninth National Assembly. We are now being joined by Dr. Abiodun Adeni, public affairs analyst and lecturer at Bayes University, Abuja, to look at the politics of the emerging Ninth Assembly and what possible scenarios to expect. Welcome to the program, sir. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Good morning, viewers. Good morning, Dr. Abiodun. It's always a pleasure to have you on. Thank you and welcome back. Um, Thanks a lot. To, Same here. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm going to jump into this right away because I think that, you know, the conversation we've been having around Dr. Um, Saraki and the and sort of the stemming of his progress, which by the Otoge movement and the build up to that. But before we go into Dr. Saraki, I want us to take a reflective look at the 8th National Assembly. And talk a little bit about how effective they were. One of the things that President Buhari said in his congratulatory speech to those coming to the, um, to the National Assembly was that he is looking forward to an effective and a mutual working relationship. And a lot of reference to that is the fact that budgets weren't passed on time. One of the things he actually specifically said is that when you have an effective legislature, you're able to pass budgets on time. There has also been quite a number of bills that haven't been passed. One of the bills that was actually pointedly asked for, um, to the president during one of the debates was the Disability Act. So if you were to be a, take a reflective look at the last assembly and as they sort of wind down their time, get, give me a sense of how you believe they've, they've performed and they've fared. And has the the politics that led into the appointments of the leadership been one of the critical things that affected their level of performance i would love to get your feed your, your just your your sense of that before we jump into what's 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 ahead okay um very well uh, biola but if you look at the history of the national assembly itself especially the recent history from the time of our recent democracy in 1999, uh, you will see that uh, there's nothing much that transpired in the Eighth National, National Assembly that we didn't see semblance of it in previous um, assemblies. And uh, it's just a, a reflection of the <coughs> larger Nigerian society, um, where you see subterfuge, where you see chicanery, uh, where you see uh, dilation, you know, um, attempts by um, participants not to be um, uh, not to be speak and span, not to be um, optimum, not to be optimal. I beg your pardon in performances. Most of the time, you see um, emergence into political offices, especially in that area and in that section of the in that arm of government, and you don't see a reflection of some of the promises they gave. Now we're talking about uh, contestation for power, for office. Okay, but hardly would you hear any one of them talking about programs, about manifestos, about their vision and mission. And um, for the Eighth National Assembly, it wasn't really different, really, because um, essentially they are a reflection of the larger society. You know, uh, everything they did reflected um, the imperfections of our society. But the tragedy of it is that as leaders, you will have expected them to rise above some of these downsides that we notice um, with the average Nigerian. And what are these downsides? You know, thinking that the present is much more important than the future, thinking that handouts are much more important than infrastructures and utilities, and believing that there's, there's, there's gain in commodification, in commodifying the political process, that there's gain in having uh, their values monetized, okay? You will have expected that National Assembly uh, to rise above those imperfections, those picadillos, predilections on the part of the people, but of course they didn't. But again, we have to call them the slack because it's just a reflection, just a continuation of 
what we have had from 1999. Uh, but how do we get out of this? We need the new National Assembly to understand that, you know, they have been called to service. And as, as people who are called to service, they're not just leaders, but they should be missionaries and visionaries who should make a difference, really. And you cannot make a difference by just, um, you know, uh, playing to the gallery, by continuing in the imperfections of um, the system, of the populace, really. You need to be able to show example, irrespective of whose ox is God, you know. Na Eighth National Assembly, nothing with every due respect, nothing much to, run, uh, to write them about, um, is also um, living up to the uh, poor billing that, you know, the average National Assembly member is not too interested in um, the reason for which he is there. And what is this main reason? The, um, uh, making of laws, you know, and making proposals around laws, you know. How many private member bills did you see passed in the Eighth Assembly? Okay, most of the bills, of course, came from the executive. Yes, we can see in the natural flu, in the natural interaction between the trinity of governments, um, uh, the executive, the judiciary, and the legislature, you can say that, yes, it is, it is the executive that is more saddled with the responsibility of coming out with bills, but it's not to say that private, private member bills are unacceptable. They are there as well, you know, and they are always welcome on the floor, but how many of them do you see? It just speaks to the imperfection, to the downside of, um, of participants in that um, arm of government. The new charge to them will be that they should try to make a difference so we could have a better Ninth Assembly. Mm. So just to um, just on this reflection before we look forward and talk about what's what to look for out for, I have to say this is a little this is very damning the, the your 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 your, um, your assessment of this of the Eighth National Assembly. One of the things that we noticed is we have a very discouraged and despondent electorate, and now you're telling us that our legislature has also not performed as we grow as we grow our de democracy and strengthen our democracy. What should we be looking for and what should we be talking to our leaders about and how do we hold them accountable? Because like you said, these are representatives of Nigeria. These are, it's, and they're representing the country and they mm -hmm. come from these districts. They come from our local communities. Mm -hmm. How do we hold them more accountable? Yeah, very well, Oji. I, I think the, the argument uh, from my end is, is that you know, we know that the National Assembly is a reflection of the larger society, no doubt. They are elected by the people, but we know the people also have some picadillos, some weaknesses, you know, um, that can be weaved around long years of uh, poverty, long years of deprivation and deprivation. And it is coming from, you know, the past failure of government. You know, it has affected their sense of judgment, their sense of reasoning with every due respect, and to a very large extent, they, they reflect um, the typical characteristic of the oppressed. You know, you just you see yourself as oppressed and you are just there um, waiting uh, for the next handout. You know, you just believe that, you take it as a fait accompli, and it's almost a finished situation, a finished condition for you. But the onus is on the leaders, the onus is on the state, through the instrumentality of the leaders, to rise, uh, to understand um, this dilemma of the Nigerian people and make a difference in their life. And, and how do you make a difference, really? You do not go into power and begin to reflect the imperfections that we have identified on the part of the people. You know, you try and make a difference in the sense, in, 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 through accountability, through transparency, and not through luxuriating, you know. When you, when you begin to luxuriate, you begin to leave, you are low in opulence, of course, the people will we, we, we not see any difference. They just see a continuation of um, the many downsides they have, that they have noticed in the system uh, in the past. They begin to, uh, they, they, do not, they are not able to appreciate Okay, the difference we are making, yes, even if it's going to be at the level of uh, the temporariness we keep talking about, handout, monetization, commodification, but that's not, that's not really what grows society. What grows society are infrastructures, utilities, uh, functional health system, functional educational system, and for all sectors working at, um, at optimum. But in a situation where you want to take the position of these uh, sectors, you want to assume um, the power of the state, 
because you have access to state resources, you have access to public till, then you are doing a disservice not just to the people, but to the legacy you are supposed to have left and the future of the nation that you are supposed to have come to help grow. So the charge to um, the new National Assembly members again is for them to try and make a difference, really. And if we, they cannot make this difference through admonition, perhaps we need to take sec some looks at our laws. You know, what is it in the law that is so permissive? What is it in the law that uh, makes people um, to believe that, you know, public till is the quickest way um, to, public, to, to, to private wealth. And by the time they do it, they, they, I mean, they, you, they splash it on your face, they ride it up short on, on you via it, something that's supposed to be a collective patrimony. What is it in our law that is so permissive that is making this to happen? Or is it that the laws are not activated or not implement, in, implemented enough? Yeah, those are the questions we need to ask so that we can effect some changes uh, for the good of this country. Thank you, sir. We are looking ahead, like you said, to the Ninth Assembly. And um, we know that their purpose is actually to enact laws and review existing ones. As they get ready to take seat, in your opinion, share what you feel some of the most important bills should be um, at the start. OK, um, thanks a lot for that. It's, it's important that, you know, the uh, first of all, we have not, not, we have many laws in this country, really. Mm -hmm. But the way social systems are is that you cannot have enough law at the same time. So you continue to examine, you continue to review, and you continue to make improvement. Is that you are amending previous ones or mm -hmm. you are adding new ones? You know, from the from from going forward, really, I think we need to be concerned much more about the electoral bill, the amendment bill, or whatever mm -hmm. it is so called. And it is um, it's going to hover around the need for us to make to introduce technology to the electoral process as much as possible, and again to uh, ensure probably think around devolving the powers of INEC. Mm -hmm. You know, INEC is such a behemoth now. INEC is so um, huge, more like an elephant, and movement agility is, is, is very problematic. You know, we saw it in the last election. We need to probably break down INEC. We need to really think about, about this very, uh, very seriously to increase its productivity and improve its efficiency. You know, because we, we just we barely wobbled through the last elections. You know, it wasn't the kind of election that you would expect from a nation that is doing um, a, 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 an election for the fifth time consistently. Uh, we thought we would have improved. We thought it would have been less violent free. We thought there would be less um, uh, rigging, allegations of rigging. Mm -hmm. And, you know, but we didn't see uh, much of that. Yes, we have gone through it. But, of course, it's, it's leaving a sour taste in the, in the mouths of many. You, we can improve on that through um, the, elect, through the National Assembly, through bills, and in many other areas as well. And then how about um, the question of our politicians being dieharded about um, political contestation? You know, what is it that makes people not um, desiring to say congratulations to the declared winner? You know, why, are we really, why do we really believe that until we get into political power, there's no other way to help the society. You know, these are values, these are virtues, you know, these are, you know, belief systems that we need to begin to think around um, changing. You know, if we cannot um, change the, those things through admonition, through impeachment, perhaps we can look at um, the laws and see how um, we can ingrain it into them. Then, uh, again, how about um, the question of, um, yeah, how about the question of people thinking that you, that, um, you can ride a rough shot on the law, thinking that the law cannot catch up with you? You know, what is it, again, that is making people, that is making the man to rule instead of the law to rule, rule in our land? Why do people resort to violence and think that, and believe, rightly so, as it were, that they cannot, they can beat the law? You know, we see this happening now and again, and we see them... Um, going scot free without being uh, prosecuted, who would have expected that just like people are tribunalizing the electoral, the post electoral process, just like uh, losers are contesting um, their, their position in the tribunal, the security agencies should as well be taking 
um, those who were violent in the election to court, we should have seen them being prosecuted. But we're not seeing all of these. What is it again that is making our security agencies allegedly lethargic? You know, why can't they activate the laws so that the law can actually deter people uh, so that in the next election in 2023 or 2027, you know, the laws will be seen as working and people will be much more compliant than we see every other time. I think these are some of the basic things we need to address, really, um, if we have to tidy up the process ahead of mm. other um, similar exercises. Okay, thank you for that. You did mention the electoral system as being something that was problematic with the rigging and the electoral violence that obviously took place within this last, last election and the need for technology to help improve. I want to know that, uh, I want to get from you, how do we begin to move from uh, a culture of corruption to one of good governance to help the system, help all of us move forward in the system? Yeah, a very valid question, really. You know, one of the major problems that we have in this country is um, corruption, and it has eaten deep into our very fabric, and it is systemic, it is deep-seated, and sometimes when you look at it, you look at it with, in, the, in, in a state of hopelessness, believing that it can hardly change. But it can change, you know. Um, if you look at the histories of nations, nations that you um, identify as civilized democracies today, nations uh, that you identify as being um, giants at the level of technology, you know, they were at their stage in years past. In the 14th, 15th century, many of them were like this. But how did they... Um, come about, how did they propel themselves out of that, that doldrum? One is leadership, you know, an understanding on the part of the leader that, yes, I want to make a difference. You know, and how do you make a difference? You, you make the difference not through mouthing it, not through blah, blah, mouthing, but through um, what you do, you know, action matters, you know, and action through precepts, like we used to say. You know, the, 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 your action, the things you do, the things you do not do, and the things people around you also do, it matters, you know. Then again, the laws have to be activated. You know, you need to see, people want to see people uh, being rightly uh, apprehended, prosecuted, you know, and sanctioned for infractions on the nation's value system, for corrupting processes. But when um, you see market lethargy, when you see people, uh, when you see a reluctance on the part of um, the authorities to deal with obvious infractions, you know, then you are not discouraging the person coming after not to do the same thing. So we need um, that kind of leader that will be courageous enough, that, that will rise above the prejudice, prejudices, that will rise above, uh, uh, you know, our, our classifications at the level of ethnicity, at the level of religion, at the level of tribe, states, and region, you know, and just see himself or herself as a Nigerian who has a mission and who has a vision and who, who will be also die-hearted in ensuring that this vision, this mission, these objective, these objectives are fulfilled. So if, that, if we have a leader that can make that difference, you know, you will just see there's no way um, the rest of the society will not follow um, suit. Leadership is very, very important in the evolution of nations. But that's what, where I see that we've been registering a lacuna over, over, over the years. So, Corruption is a, is a problem, no doubt, okay, but it is not peculiar to, to Nigeria. Nations have been in it in years past, but they've gone, through, gone over it through the instrumentality of leadership, through changing their system, you know, and through ensuring that people and citizens do not take advantage of weak systems, okay? Um, corruption thrives because the system is weak. If you, if you strengthen the system, introduce rightful technologies, you know, people, the nature of man is to take advantage of system, to take advantage of, advantages of processes and procedures. Okay, but if you prevent him, if you block those advantages, the, the man will be forced to comply. And when the man fails to comply, then the law will take his course. We need to follow um, these steps one after the other, but for us to do this, um, uh, gentle ladies, we need um, a, a leader that is committed you know, that has a very strong sense of mission and that has a good sense of vision as well. All right, Dr. Denny, you're absolutely correct that leadership is very important. So uh, would you want to give us your impression of Dr. Saraki's presidency of the Senate in terms of the impact on statutory responsibility of that chamber? 
Um, by and large, if we look at the history of the Senate, um, Bukola Saraki is probably the youngest person to have occupied that office. I mean, the recent history of the Senate, that is, from the time of advance, we him to Chuba Akadibo, to Ken Inamani, to, no, no, to Ayim Payosayim, Ken Inamani, the David Bonaventure, Mark, and himself. Okay, perhaps Ayim will could rival him and at the age of ascension. So as a relatively young person, I think he came with a lot of verb, with a lot of enthusiasm. But it was it was let down really. It was it was burdened by um, the, by the trial that he faced. Well, we're not going to look at the validity or invalidity of of that uh, judicial experience. It's all over now, you know. But by and large, even while he was being charged, even while controversy trail is the way he uh, came out of he, the way he emerged as a president, you know, he he tried to create some kind of distraction by concentrating on the, the job, honorous job of the Senate presidency. I would say he did his bit, you know, he, he, he tried his best, but he could have done better um, at the level of um, finding a comprehensive synergy with the executive. You know, people, some people might want to praise him for being politically savvy, but what's the essence of being politically savvy um, when you, you couldn't um, find your way out of uh, personal crisis, you know, where you are, um, some idiosyncrasies uh, weighed you down and you couldn't um, really function well with other arms that you're supposed to work well with. You know, but I would say that it is not you know, dimities for him yet. It's the young man relatively, he's a quinquagenarian in his 50s. Um, the future is still bright for him. You know, hopes are still high. He can still make a difference in the future. But it's, it's also nice to say that he probably will have learned some good lesson by being one of the people that have been fortunate to lead Nigeria through um, the prism of the Senate presidency. Thank you, um, Dr. Adeni. I think we felt it was very necessary to take a look um, at the past as we sort of go forward and make a dis uh, as we go forward to see how the Ninth National Assembly plays out. Now, getting into the politics and the jostling for the leadership, I have a couple of questions for you. One of the things we've seen from APC's perspective is this dominance and supremacy of all leadership positions in, 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 both, in both chambers. I want to get from you with, the voc with how vocal the party chairman has been and also with a lot of the nudging from the presidency. What are your opinions on how this meddling will play out in the, in, in, in the, nas in the Ninth National Assembly? Yeah, I think we also alluded to it um, a little bit earlier um, when we say that political processes, you know, are not are not mathematical processes. You know, um, election and electionary processes, you know, are very fluid. You know, they are very um, are big in the form in which they, in the shape in which they take in the course of time. It's okay to see that for, for elders, I mean, for leaders to emerge in a political process, it can be through election, it can also be through consensus. You know, negotiation cannot be ruled out. You know, uh, call for understanding, um, call for moral situation is very uh, all right in any political process. And it's okay for the leaders of the party, APC, the majority in the National Assembly, uh, for that matter, to try to rein in on their members on who they want to. Um, emerge as leaders, but there's nothing in the Constitution that says that um, all, uh, all this kind of person or that kind of person should be the one to emerge, really. That's what uh, we need to also understand, and that's what played out in um, 2015 mm -hmm. when Ekwere Madu emerged as Deputy Senate President, mm -hmm. uh, despite being a member of the minority party. You know, you cannot rule that out in this National Assembly again because um, it's always a very turbulent place and the politics is always very unpredictable. But for Ross to uh, say that the, or probably insinuate that what the leaders are doing in trying to suggest who the leader should be, I don't think they are really wrong in doing that because it's part of the political process. Um, they are the, uh, um, uh, at the level of authority, they are their leaders. You know, perhaps it's just a plea they are making, it's just an appeal, you know, but, if it, but they cannot really enforce that appeal, really. So it cannot go beyond just suasion, just appeal, just a plea. 
You, because you cannot go beyond that because they're not going to be on the floor of the Senate or on the floor of the House of Representatives on the day of the election. Those who will vote are those who Nigerians voted for to be in that place. But we, at the same time, we cannot uh, put them down for making those suggestions. Perhaps they are, they are seeing what others are not seeing. But again, it boils down to um, the long-standing problem in our polity where a majority will always have to want to carry um, the whole thing, you know, where the winner will always want to take everything. And it's probably the being of our polity where the losers also are always vociferous, where they are always hell bent on, um, on struggling, on fighting, just to make sure that they don't lose it all. You know, uh, the reason why, again, losers don't want to be seen as losers, they want to fight until they become um, the winner, you know, because the winner is taking all. So perhaps we need to uh, think about some level of representation for the losers so that they can also feel integrated, they can also feel in involved in the system because democracy in itself is about involvement, it's about participation. Uh, it's not about exclusion. So when you begin to exclude people at different levels, it just it creates um, pain, it creates anguish, and people want to um, rock the boat. That's not what you need in a democratic setting. Mm. Um, Dr. Adeni, one of the things that we did during the last few elections was do quite a lot of analysis and predictions, and some a lot of your predictions did come through, especially in the governorship um, elections. I would like to get I would like to get a Thank sense you, from Bella. you <laughs> what you think is going to happen between Ahmed Lawan, who obviously is one of the is the party um, <laughs> favorite, um, Undume, who has also been going up, and Goje. Who do you really think that there is a tussle for power here, or do you think that this is a foregone conclusion for Lawan? <laughs> okay, thanks a lot. <laughs> okay, um, well, it's, it's also okay to make a try at the level of prediction. But the, 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 the tangle is really interesting. At the same time, you just look at it and wonder um, that it's a reflection <laughs> of the many contradictions in our, in our system. Because um, there have been arguments that, um, you know, why should we have a vice president and a speaker from the same region? Uh, well, why should we have the president and uh, one of the contestants in the, in the Senate from the same region? Then why should we have somebody uh, from, you know, from, the, from the North, president and the proposed or uh, potential Senate president from the North? You know? What about the Southeast? What about the South-South? What about the, um, the North Central? You know? What about these areas? So these are valid questions. That's why I said that uh, political processes in this part of the world is full of contradictions. You know? um, the, how we resolve this contradiction is just uh, up to our ingenuity. But at the level of prediction in terms of who will carry the day, I am very confident that um, the party, their members, the hierarchy will not want what happened to them in 2015 to happen because what happened in 2015 they was really outsmarting. They were completely outsmarted. Uh, you know, they were, they were almost badgered. They were bruised. They were flustered. And they will want to work against it this time so that, yes, as a majority, rightly or wrongly, they need to uh, be in charge of the National Assembly, in complete charge of, of the National Assembly. So I see them working towards the, um, the, the, the working towards party line, uh, which is why Ahmed Lawan is likely to carry the day, but he shouldn't think that it's not going to be by the skin of his teeth. You know, he's going to continue to fight until the last day. Otherwise, uh, Undume is very strategic. You know, Undume might align with the opposition and draw some votes from there, get some votes from the, the majority party, and make a very statement, a very strong statement at the level of the result of the elections. You know, and if, if what about Goji, don't forget former governor, where former presidential aspirant, very strategic person as well, you know, with immense war chest. You know, all these people, they, 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 are, they are master horse traders. You know, they, they, can, they can pull the rug off uh, anyone's feet. You know, but even at that, you know, uh, Ahmed Lawan is likely um, to carry the day. But don't forget what I said. It might be, again, by the skin of his teeth. Uh, thank you for that. Um, I would like to get your opinion. Um, the right. PDP cactus played a telling role in the emergence of the leadership of the 8th National Assembly. Do you foresee a repeat? Um, sorry, could you say that again? Beg yes. your pardon? Yes. The PDP, the cactus, they played a telling role in the emergence of the leadership of the 8th National Assembly. In this National Assembly coming forward, do you foresee a repeat? Yes. 
Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They are definitely going to play a very important. You don't, yeah, it comes down to what we've been talking about, you know, that, you know, even if they're a minority party, they want to see their influence in play. Okay, they want to see their number working for them and they want their voice to be heard. You know, nobody wants to be in this part, nobody wants to be on the losing side because where you, where you are the loser, you are, you are losing all, almost uh, practically. And when you are the winner, you are taking all, you know, almost realistically as well. So, yes, they are the minority party, but you find out at the end of the day that their voice will, remain, will continue to be the loudest, you know. The, their voice will continue to be the louder voice on the floor of the, uh, of the Senate. And how do they want to make a statement, really, even as losers? Uh, they want to make a statement by being uh, critical in discussions on who emerges as the, as the president, as, who emerges as the leader of, as their leaders, really. You know, and we, we saw this happening, in, we saw this happen in 2015, like you rightly said, and they are waiting in the wings. I'm very sure that they are even much more alert than the APC partisans, you know, because they are the ones that are, that, that are in the minority, and they are like the bride waiting to be courted by the, 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 uh, by, by the tangling aspirants from the APC um, side, you know. So they're, they're just waiting, and I think, and, and, and I grieve APC contestant might take advantage of um, the eagerness of the PDP minority um, to be influential, to be considered, you know, in the scheme of things, and eventually in the emergence of who emerges as, um, who, uh, in, in the process of who emerges as their leader. You know, so they will continue to be uh, critical, really, and like it happened in 2015, it might happen again in 2019, but perhaps it may not be on that same scale, but we can definitely not ignore them. All right, um, so last time out, uh, the PDP was rewarded with the Deputy Senate Presidency for its role during the National Assembly elections. What sort of reward um, do you foresee yeah. that awaits them this time in the event of another um, palace coup? Yeah, it, it can be anything, you know, like we always say, political processes are fluid, they are more big, and they are unpredictable, you know, if they cannot get as high as the deputy senior president like they got uh, the last time. There are many committees that are there, yeah, don't, don't forget also, uh, the parties also have their position, you know, but in, in most cases, uh, some of them actually negotiate for the so-called juicy committee, you know, and very strategic, very important committee, appropriation, housing, works, FCDA, the, pro the proverbial um, juicy committee, committees are there for them to negotiate for, you know, and so many things go on in that place that we don't even know. We just belabor ourselves. We talk about some of these, uh, the ones that are public knowledge, mm -hmm. but there are so many benefits that go on in, in that National Assembly that if the populace actually know, perhaps uh, they'll be much more agitated, they'll be much more concerned about their attitude towards the arm of government. You know, but again, if the minority party helps a particular candidate to become Senate, to become a leader of that um, assembly, you do not expect the leader um, to leave them behind in any way. Like, like it happened in the case of Saraki. Very likely, Saraki was protective of the minority PDP before he um, joined them eventually as APC leader. He was protective of them. And you do not expect that not to happen if the minority PDP this time again support somebody to become um, a leader of, uh, of the Senate. But will that happen again is what we're saying. It, it depends on how smart the APC is, how protective they can be of their interests, and how consistent and forward-looking um, they can be in the management of their affairs. But if they fail, if they falter, um, rest assured that you know, the opposition will take advantage and they will get embarrassed yet again, like it happened in 2015. Mm. Um, going back to that, I know we had talked about the Senate president and the deputy. Um, I wanted to talk to you a yeah. little bit about the speaker and some of your predictions around that. Once again, the APC has yes. identified yes. Bajabia Mila um, by all stats. He's qualified. He's, you know, he's a he's an old hand in the in the house. What do you think, or do you think there is any room for any yeah. surprises? And if so, who do you think will be those surprises? Do you think Vago, Onyejocha, or 
or cough for someone that we're not even seeing. What surprises do you think we can expect? Or once again, is this a foregone conclusion? <laughs> Yeah, uh, very well. You see, if you look at the uh, the House of Reps too, it's been um, even a much more interesting case because of their number, you mm -hmm. know, and it's been one process that has always been turbulent from 1999, from the time of Salih Subuhari to Gali Naba, you know, and to the surprises that um, some some of the officials have pulled in working a green or in working against the green of. Uh, party influence or party suggestion, you know, always very interesting. But in the circumstance, I think I, th uh, Baja is probably being, Baja Bia being like that, he is probably being considered because um, he has spent some time in the, mm -hmm. in, the, in the House of Representatives. He is sophisticated, you know, he's polished, uh, very good in presentation, and is the kind of person you probably want to, uh, you want to see in a position of authority despite his downsides, you know, buying a hundred million dollar car for the wife after saving it, like he told, after saving that money, like he told us, you know, yes, we have, like it is with every woman, good and uh, bad side, and, you know, downsides anyway. Um, let's not uh, come to judgment on, on his personality. But the point to, is to be made is as a good leader, as an experienced legislator, you know, it's not going to be bad as a leader of the National Assembly, uh, as the leader of the House of Rep Representatives, as a speaker. You know, and again, he has made his mark, he has paid his dues, mm -hmm. and to the level that the party is supporting him, irrespective of the fact that we have a vice president coming from his region. You know, so it's not about regional balancing now, it's more about personality and exposure and the person in question. But um, will he make it? You know, despite complaints, despite agitation from other sections of the country, particularly and most importantly and most appropriately the Southeast and the South South, will he make it? I think he will also make it, you know, but it's going to take a lot more horse trading, a lot more um, agitation, a lot more consistency, and a lot more bargaining and negotiation. You know, um, he's not going to sleep until the elections are held, mm. but it will carry the day still. Thank you for that. I wanted to, um, you mentioned something sort of about the zoning, not about region, but about personality. And also, I wanted to get your sense of um, Kant, and you know, when, when we get voices like Kant saying that um, they want um, balance in the Ninth um, National Assembly, we're getting different voices that are talking about balances. Are we really talking about zoning here? Or are we talking more about personalities? And, and you brought that up a couple of times, and I just want us to clarify so that people at home know what we're talking about when it comes to the Ninth National Assembly. Um, you, you will agree with me that it's just a, an unfortunate character of our political process, you know, where people play up classifiers, where they play up dividers in agitation for public offices. Ordinarily, these things should have battered, really. You know, like, it, like now, it, is not much, it, it, it didn't matter in the consideration for who becomes the speaker, because if it matters, you won't say, the party will not be saying that Bajabi Amina should be speaker when the vice president is from the um, southwest. And again, look at Kaduna, for instance. Kaduna has also gone a step, a, a a step further to prove that classifications, uh, div social divides, does not really matter. The Nasir Arifat chose... Um, a Muslim as deputy governor, and they won that election. You know, so it's an instruction to us, or it's a sign that we're moving in some kind of positive direction in this country, that we'll get to a stage where we'll not be talking about regions, we'll not be talking about that tribe, about um, whether the person is a Christian or a Muslim. You'll just be looking at the person's ability to perform. And that's a major regret, really, uh, with these contestations going on in the National Assembly. Nobody's talking about the ability of the person. Nobody's mm -hmm. talking about um, the potentials of the person taking us out of uh, the many imperfections in that place where we have um, a, a loop-sided budget cycle, where we have delays in budget um, cycle, where we have budget padding and all of that. Nobody's talking about sanitizing that process, but rather we're talking about um, a ranking senator, ranking House of Representatives member, 
Uh, we're talking about religion. We're talking about somebody's talking about Christianity or Muslim. All these things don't really matter, really, because we've had where the most religious person have been in position and they have perverted the system. They've looted all these positions that we have seen, all these cases of corruption we've been registering in this country. Many of these actors, perpetrators are either Muslims or Christians. So how does it matter, really? You know, it's about performance, it's about integrity, it's about ability to deliver. And we shouldn't be distracted, we shouldn't be uh, bothered about these classifiers, these retrogressive and primitive dividers that has badgered and battered this, this nation up to this time. You know, it, it shouldn't really matter. We should be more concerned about um, who uh, will liberate us, who will contribute, who will rise above the predilections, the picadillos that we're talking about on the people's side, and be concerned about the infrastructures and utilities, about the improving the health sector and the education sector, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's the kind of thing we should uh, be concerned with going forward. Thank you. Sir, in previous elections, President Buhari has maintained a no stance and intervention when it comes to the elections of the National Assembly. I want to get your take on this. Should he be taken serious, given the problems that were caused in the last dispensation by that same stance, or should we expect him to be more influential, seeing that this is his last four years as president? Yeah, very well. But I, but I think that he has indicated an interest somehow through the party. Uh, do not forget that before um, APC chairman Adam Sushomole came out and advised the legislature, they had visited the president, and the president, of course, was warm to them. So perhaps he had operated subtly through um, the party structure. You know, uh, I would take that, for instance, as an indication of, in, of his interest. I don't forget that the, the president is a very subtle person, but it can be subtly effective, too. Um, all through the time of Sharaki, if you see his body language, you see he was never at peace with him. You will see he never really enjoyed the leadership of um, Sharaki as senior president. And, of course, you cannot take it away from what happened or how Sharaki emerged um, into that position. You know, so subtly, I think he has indicated his interest. It may not be as open-minded. Um, the strategy may not be quite different from that of uh, Olusegun or Basanjo. You know, Olusegun or Basanjo is a much more enthusiastic person. He will have come out and say, this is the person I want. And if you go against that advice, he can also use anti-democratic means uh, to get his interest, at, uh, uh, his desire achieved. He did it in the case of uh, uh, Chuba Okadibo, and he almost did it against uh, Aim. But just that, at, as, as, as at that time, um, the senators were tired. They're fed up of uh, his perpetual intervention, so to say. So Buhari is completely somewhat different from um, Obasanjo in terms of strategy. But I think he has expressed his interest on who he wants to lead the, party, the National Assembly through the party. You know, and it, it will pay him, really, because we, he needs an understanding National Assembly, even if we're not saying that it should be a rubber stamp National Assembly. Don't forget that governance in the democratic process um, is a trinity, and the National Assembly remains the place where thoughts on policies, directions are expanded, you know, where uh, a better appreciation is given to uh, government and legislative proposals. Okay, so it is the intellectual arm of government, irrespective of uh, the disparate nature of qualification in there. They use consultants, they use stakeholders, and through their you know, uh, understanding about policies, the directions and issues are expanded and we appreciate it. And it stimulates uh, the system, stimulates ideas, and brings about development, which is also the essence, essence, uh, essence of uh, democracy. Uh, so it is the, in the interest of the president uh, to make sure that you know, he has a national assembly they can understand, associate with his vision, his mission, for the easy achievement of his aims and objectives. In the bastion of democracy, United States, that we talk about all the time, it is the president will not be happy if he has, if his party is not in the major, in the minor, in, if it's not in the majority. He wants the party to be his party, to be in the majority, so that his policies, his ideas can be better implemented, and it's not going to be met with too many obstacles, too many obstructions, you know, too many delays, you know, um, at the level of debates, you know. So um, the president can take a cue from that, and I think he has subtly done that. 
And um, we'll just see how it plays out eventually. All right, Dr. Adeni, how do you see the elections uh, going in the House of Representatives with uh, the popular Yakubu Dogara still oh, okay. in the running? Um, do you think that uh, party uh, su supremacy will, uh, will um, finally hold? Yeah, Dr. Adeni, it would be nice to get a sense from oh. you. I mean, I know that we had talked about, um, and you said that Bajamila is basically going to be the speaker, but it'll be great to just get yeah. also add the Dogara um, yes. effect into that and get a sense of what you think about that. Mm -hmm. Do you know, in, in 2015, it was supposed to be Bajabia Miller, you know, but somehow the legislators themselves wanted Dogara, and they, that was marked against um, the advice of the party. You know, he's a very popular person, no doubt. He has led them very well, even though he's uh, very tactical, uh, much more reserved, you know, m much less um, sophisticated. He's a conservative person from my uh, appreciation, you know. And he, he's, he remains a major contender. He remains a major contender. But don't forget, there are some backdoor um, tacticians, there are some backdoor strategies that plays out in political processes. And some of these backdoor strategy really um, has instruments like tools, like money, like influence, okay, and like material things that can be played, that can be displayed, that can be deployed, you know, to achieve purposes. Many of these things we will not know, but eventually you begin to hear them authoritatively in circles, how they were displayed, how they were brought to bear you know, against one person or the other, and how it probably played out in, um, in the eventual result that we are seeing in the open space. You know, so it's going to be a combination of front door and back door, a combination of the, of the overt and the covert. You know, all these factors will come in. And by the time they start coming in, it's going to be difficult for us to say that, okay, because this person was overtly nice, uh, this person was overtly sophisticated, um, he's going to, uh, he, he, he won. You know, it's going to be a play of, of these binaries, you know, and they will eventually determine who wins. But it's the reason why perhaps the, the contest in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the House of Representatives, it is really why it's going to be much more fierce than what we're going to witness in the, in the Senate. You know, but I'm um, just marginally giving it to Bajabi Amelia, given his history and given the fact that Dogara is no longer, you know, at peace with um, his party. I mean, sorry, with his former party and the fact that he's coming from a minority party in the circumstance. You know, that's why I'm just marginally giving it to uh, Bajabi Amelia. Well, thank you, Dr. Adini. It's always great talking to you and getting yeah. your perspective on who will be the leadership of the Ninth National Assembly. Thank you very much. We look forward to talking to you again yeah. and um, seeing how right you were. Thank you very much. It's time now for a short break. When we return, security consultant Kabir Adamu will be joining us to discuss the resurgence of insurgency and terrorism across the northeastern parts of Nigeria. Stay with us.